<coughs> Hi folks, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com and don't forget to look for Royal Blood Ministries website too. You can also get me on Facebook and Twitter and it's lovely to be with you. There's also uh, Royal Blood Ministries, Twitter and Facebook, uh, Twitter sorry, uh, and there is a website. So it's good to be with you and I'm going to pray and uh, just ask the Lord's blessing. Dear Father, we come before you today. We thank you for this day and we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your blessing. We confess all sin before you, O oh God, and we acknowledge our weakness and our sin. Father God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will bless this sermon and that, Lord, you would minister to each one of us, that everybody who hears your word today that, Father, you would minister to them and speak to them. And that, Lord, you would draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So forgive me if I scratch my tooth. I've just had my teeth, so forgive me. The sermon is the day of the Lord. So turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Get your Bible out, folks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is a sermon I preached at a church last week. And uh, a church that I preached this week in two different churches. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times of the seasons, verse 1. Of, but of the times of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, and are sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober-minded. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk, are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, and love, and of a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but attained salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves <clears throat> together and edify one another, even also as you do. In the first, during the First World War, just before it started, there was a, a woman, a lady in uh, Buckingham, Buckinghamshire, and uh, she, had a, she lived in a little village and she had a cottage and she had three sons who were like in their 20s and they were just enjoying the summer and they looked at the clouds and they just enjoyed it and that same year her son, two sons, three sons were, went in the first world war, two of them died and the other one was badly wounded. That family had no idea and did not expect the First World War to come, but it came, suddenly, unexpectedly, and it brought devastation. This chapter that we're looking at is about the Lord's coming, that it's coming unexpectedly, and it's coming with great destruction, and we have to be ready for it. We have to be ready for the Lord's coming back. If we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 to 5 This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good Traitors, heading minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God Having a form of godliness but denying the power of it from such turn away. For this sort are, the, are they who creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, 
led away with various lust. But here Paul is talking about the end times. Lovers of pleasure, lo covetous, boasters, proud. Man has his season, but God has his season. And his season is the, is the day of the Lord, when the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and he'll come unexpectedly. 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Sorry, forgive me for doing that. <laughs> 2 Peter, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. It takes time to find the scripture, but it's a good discipline to help us to know where the Bible is. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Knowing the first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There'll be a, there are people today who wonder, well, you, pre, you people believe Jesus is coming, but where is he? Where is his coming? And many in the church today, many Christians, don't, don't really think about the second coming of the Lord, that the Lord could come back in your generation, any time in your generation, he could come back. Do we think about that? Do we think about the Lord's second coming, that he'll come back, that he'll come back for his church? I've got four points. Four points, friends. Number one, do you have a hope in these last days? Do you have a hope in these last days? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. Now, we, in order to understand chapter 5, we have to go to chapter 4. St. Augustine was asked by his students how to be a good Bible teacher. And St. Augustine said this, there's only three things that you need to know to be a good Bible teacher. Number one, context. Number two, Context. Number three, context. So let's look at the context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also, also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with, bring with him. Paul is dealing with bereavement. People are dying, you know the Lord. And Paul is saying, those who die in the Lord don't be sad because they'll be with Jesus. And on the day of the resurrection, when they're resurrected, they'll be with Jesus. Everything's going to be okay if you believe in Jesus. If you trust in Jesus, if you die, you have a hope. There is a hope. Do you know Jesus? Do you really, really know him? He said, Jay, I know him. I'm born again. Are you really born again? Did you know the Assemblies of God did a mission and in one year they had five million converts? Five million converts. How many of them go to church now? Out of that five million, five hundred thousand. Out of that five million, only five hundred thousand go to church. In other words, there are many fake conversions. Do you really, really know the Lord Jesus Christ? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When Christ came and died on that cross, he died as a savior. He died as a sacrifice for your sin. He was crushed by the wrath of the father for your sin. Do you understand that the beautiful Lord died in your place? And that if he'd not died for you, you'd have gone to hell. But he died on the cross for you. And now you've repented and you believe in Jesus and you're cleansed and you're washed and you're clean. And you do not fear the wrath of God anymore. For it says there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Romans 8 verse 1. Have you come to that faith in Christ and you're resting in him and you know the peace of God that passes all understanding? Have you really closed with Jesus? Because 
those are the only ones will, who have a hope for when they die. And if you don't really know Jesus, you don't have that hope. You need to know Jesus personally. Don't kid yourself with a fake conversion. Have you really been converted? Are you really trusting the Lord as your saviour? Verse, verse uh, 15 again, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's talking about the second coming. Now this passage is used a lot by preachers and they preach a whole all oh, lot about uh, the tribute, uh, the uh, the rapture, and it's a secret rapture and all the rest. That that's just a just mumbo jumbo. What we've got to realize is that if we know Christ, if He come back right now, we'll be with Him. We have a hope. We have a hope, a hope that when we die, we'll be with the Lord. If the Lord comes back, we'll be with the Lord. We're not just going to be in the grave and that's it. We have a hope. Contrast that with atheism. Maybe you, you, you're thinking, you know what, Jay, this Bible stuff is a load of rubbish. And, I, and I've been hoodwinked as an evangelical and I, I think I should be an atheist. Mm, you do, do you? Well, let's look at atheism. Richard Dawkins said, the universe is but blind indifference. Richard Dawkins is a famous atheist. The universe is but blind indifference. You know what that means? It means a cockroach is the same value as a baby. You're just a bit of dust in the universe. You're all the same value. It doesn't matter whether a cockroach is killed or a baby is killed. They're all the same. There's no hope for the grave there, my friend. That is the logic of atheism. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 17 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have a hope when the Lord comes back, we will be with him. Do you think much about the Lord's coming? Do you think much about the Lord's coming? Think about it. Do you have a hope? Have you really come to know the Lord in your life or is it a fake conversion do you really trust him do you really trust Christ and Christ alone for your salvation or are you following Christ for what you can get out of him are you following him because your mum and dad are pressuring you to go to church are you following him because it, it's the cool thing of some of your friends to do why why are you going to church or why why are you naming the name of Christ? You need to name him because he's real to you. You need to name him because you found him as your Lord and Saviour. You need to name him because you've been connected to the Father through him. Because you trust him and, you, and you've come to know him as your Lord and Saviour. So you need to pray, Lord, open my eyes that I may see the salvation that you procured for me. That's what you need to do. Is it real? Are you really saved? Are you really born again? Or are you a fake Christian like millions of people are? Where they come into church and they say they're Christian but they're gone within weeks or months. Never to be seen again because it never ever went deep in the heart of a real salvation and a real personal relationship with Jesus. Ask the Lord to come into your life. Say, Lord, forgive me of my sin and ask him to... To, to make himself known to you and may your salvation be a real salvation. So, do you have a hope in these last days? Second, are you grounded in these last days? Are you grounded in these last days? If you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1 to 2. But of the times of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief of the night. He's saying, I've no need to write to you. You know this teaching, my friends, he's saying. My friend, 
Do you know the Lord's word? Do you know the word of God? Are you grounded in this? If you're not grounded in this, you're going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Some guy's going to come on television and he's going to throw a handkerchief. He's going to say he's been to hell and he's come back. He's written a book about it. And he says, here's my Yankee chief, you need to send me $20. And if you send me $100, you'll get a special blessing. And so there you are, you come to church, say, oh, this, this preacher is really, really good, super spiritual. He's been to hell, he's written a book on it. Marvellous, absolutely marvellous. Oh, I've sent him, I've sent him uh, $100. Uh, he doesn't believe in the Trinity, but he's still spiritual because he's been to hell. And your pastor's going to turn around and say, well, number one, the Bible teaches the Trinity. So this, this guy you're into, he's just a heretic. You see, you're not going to spot this guy being a heretic if you're just looking for preachers on the television or on the internet. But you're not in the word of God. You need to be in the word of God, my friend. You cannot survive in this last days if you're not in the word of God. There's going to be many, many false teachers around. And how are you going to spot the false teachers if you're not grounded in the word of God? You're always going to be knocked from side to side with every wind of doctrine because you're not grounded in the word of God. And the Thessalonian people were grounded in the word of God. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You need to be grounded in the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Two Timothy chapter 3. And we'll read at verse 12. Ye that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But even men Evil men and seducers shall become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But, says Paul, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of, of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, the scriptures make wise unto salvation and wise in our living. Oh, my friends. Oh, you can read your Derrida, you can read your Foucault, you can read your Kant, you can read your Hume, you can read your Thomas Mann, you can read your Dostoevsky and your Tolstoys, you can read your Virginia Woolf, but oh, you, you, you cannot compare that with the scripture, the Holy Bible. It's magnificent and glorious and wonderful, for it teaches us about Jesus Christ our Saviour. Oh, it's beautiful, the Word of God. Excellent and beautiful is the Word of God. The Quran is just a gibbering little bits of gibberish. It doesn't make any sense. The same with the Book of Mormon. It just doesn't make any sense. But all oh, the Bible, the Bible feeds your soul. And you can never, ever exhaust the depths and the riches of the Word of God. In Holy Scripture, the Bible. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. Come on, get your Bible out, folks. We're having a, a Bible time. Proverbs chapter 30. Come on. Don't sit there just looking at me like some little lamb. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Be a Berean and check the scripture. Proverbs 35 and 6 says this. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto those who put their trust in him. And thou add, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto those who put their trust in him. And you can read... Uh, 
Read the whole Psalm of 119 for a study on the Word of God. Then turn to Isaiah 55 verse 11. Excuse me. Isaiah 55 verse 11. Come on now. Isaiah 55, chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things therein I sent it. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is inspired of God. And it's there to equip you, to feed you, to help you to, to, to know how to be a spiritual man or woman. And it is your roadmap to heaven, my friends. So don't neglect it. You cannot stand in the day, in the last days, singing a few songs, watching a few preachers on the God channel and think that that is going to get you through. No, you need to be a Berean. You need to study the word of God. You need to be grounded in sound doctrine and you need to make sure that you're grounded because if you're not grounded, I guarantee you'll be tossed to and fro. You'll be like a little dinghy on a storm. And the dinghy's just being thrown here and there and here and there. You need to be grounded and rooted in the word of God, my friend. Are you ready in the last days? Are you grounded in the last days? Are you ready in the last day, days? Here's a question. How spiritually minded are you? How spiritually minded are you? Let's see how spiritually minded you are. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. So he says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So here Paul is saying, look, when the Lord is coming back, people won't be expecting it. People that will be spiritually asleep. They'll not be expecting his coming and they'll be taken by surprise. You want to really know what, whether you're spiritual or not is, is here's the answer. He said, well, Jay, I speak in tongues. I'm super spiritual, bro. Jay, I'm in the worship group. I play the drums and I play the guitar. Jay, I know my theology, bro. I read my theology. Jay, I'm loving. Jay, I do things behind the scenes uh, in the church. I'm super spiritual. So all these are signs that you, you're saying you're super spiritual. But here's a question. Do you think regularly and meditate much that on the second coming of the Lord, that the Lord could come back at any time? In your generation? This teaching that the Lord could come back any time in your generation was a teaching that was regularly preached. There are certain things that happen, have to happen before the Lord comes back. For example, um, there's a revival of, of, uh, amongst the Jewish people in Romans 9, 10 and 11. There's more earthquakes and wars and all the rest of it. But the Lord's coming will come as a surprise and it could come in your generation. And that was taught regularly in the church. 20, uh, 30, 40 years ago, you would have regular sermons on this. Now we don't get that. What we do get are hacks, theological hacks who, who spend a lot of time preaching on prophecy and, and telling us that Russia is Magog and, and all the rest of it. We get these theological hacks who are... Uh, uh, preaching on these various uh, prophecies and everything. But I'm not on about that. I'm on about. And, and arguing about pre-trip, post-trip and, you know, and, and all the rest of it. I'm not on about that. I'm on about the simple truth. That in your generation, the Lord could come back at any time. Do you meditate much on that? And if you don't, it tells you this. That what has happened 
is we become secularized without realizing it. We don't think much about heaven anymore. You know, there's an old saying, he's no, he's no earthly, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly use. That's an old saying. He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly use. But today the church has become so earthly minded that it's no heavenly use. There's no heavenly use. There's no focusing on heaven and meditating on heaven and meditating on the Lord is coming back in our generation, could come back in our generation. Now, the Irenaeus, the great early church father, in his own way, from uh, reading uh, about Noah, worked out a day when the Lord would come back, and he got it wrong. He was a great man of God, but he got it wrong. There was a, a minister on the, Westminster, on the, West, on the uh, panel of the Westminster Confession, uh, one of the great Westminster divines, a great, great uh, Bible teacher and scholar, worked out a day when he said the Lord was coming back and he got it wrong. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have said the day when the Lord is coming back. And they got it wrong. So anybody who says to you that they know the exact day that the Lord is coming back, you've got to be very, very wary of because nobody knows. But what the Bible does teach is that he is coming back and we're to be ready for him and he could come back in our generation. And we're to look for the signs and to, we're to keep awake and we're to be ready for him. Okay. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew uh, 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as were not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, not ever shall be. And except those days shall be shown, there should not, should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shown. Then if any man shall say unto thee, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So he's talking there that he's coming back, but there'll be many false people who are saying that they know when Christ is coming and to follow them. So we're to be very, very wary. Are you thinking much about eternity? Or have you become secularized without realizing it? We're living in a very secular age and people can be speaking in tongues and they can be dancing up and down and they can be listening to the music in the church, they can be reading good theology books, they can, they can uh, uh, be even doing good deeds, but even all that, there is an acid that has come in the church and we've become secularized. And the proof of the secularization is this. I can prove it to you in your own heart. Do you daily expect the Lord to come back in your generation? Are you meditating on it much? Does it, does, it, does it influence your life? Does it influence your thinking daily, weekly? And if it doesn't, what's happened is you become secularized rather than spiritualized by the Bible. It's very, very solemn and serious when you realize Actually, your own spiritual condition is nowhere near as strong as you think you are. We need to be more in the Word and more in prayer and more thinking much about spiritual things than we are doing at the moment. And then finally, 
Are you walking in the light in the last days? Spurgeon, when he was a boy, Spurgeon was a great pre uh, Baptist preacher, Reformed Baptist preacher, but for those who don't know, but Spurgeon, as a boy, uh, his granddad was a minister, and his, his granddad had a parishioner who, who was in, uh, went, went to his church. And uh, one Sunday, he was not in church, but this parishioner, but in the pub, drinking away and wasting his time getting drunk. Spurgeon, the boy, went in and said, you're breaking my far grandfather's heart. Get back to church. Well, you know, in a way, we're, we are breaking God's heart today because we're not living a holy life as we should. If we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober-minded. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk, are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and of a helmet of hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying here is, look, the Lord is coming back, possibly in your generation. You've got to be aware of this, that it could happen in your generation. So let's walk as children of the light. Don't walk as some people falling asleep or getting drunk, living a life of sin, but live a light of, of light and holiness in the expectation of the Lord's coming. In Manchester, we had the gay pride last week. Why, why, why is there so much sin in America and sin in Europe? What, why is it so dark? What's the reason for it? Why are we in such a mess? How do we advance against uh, all the immorality that we see all around us? Turn to 1 Corinthians 7, 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The reason why... The gay rights movement is so powerful in America and in Europe is simply this, is the church is not holy. The church is not a holy church and our lives are not holy. We have allowed sin in the camp, sin in our own lives, personal lives, sin in the community. And until we purge that sin, until we repent of that sin, until we get close to God and repent of the sins, that are in our own lives and the sin in the church, until we purge ourselves, we will always be weak and our enemies will grow in strength. If the church lived a holy life, let's turn to Hebrews 12, 14. If the church lived a holy life, then people will be coming to church and seeking salvation because they would know and sense that God is in the midst. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. It's so important to live a holy life. But all across the board, we compromise. I'll give you an example. Many, 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 many ministers today, preachers, many of them, even evangelical, will say things like this. Well, there's certain bits in the Bible we don't really have to uh, take note of. We, can, we, we, we don't have to bother about that bit of the Bible. And so what you, what you get is that God is not going to bless churches and mi missionaries and, uh, sorry, ministries that have ministers who will compromise on the word of God. 
God's just not going to bless a church or bless a ministry where ministers are picking and mixing the bits that they're saying they'll follow and the bits that they don't want to follow. And you see this in marriages. A lot of marriages, the husband or the wife, they'll not obey the word of God. They'll pick and, and mix. The, when it says, wives uh, obey your husbands, the wives will say, oh, that's not for today. You know? Or the husbands, when it says, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, well or, or, or no, she's got to obey me. And, and, and not taking on board the other scriptures where it says, well, you've got to love her like Christ loved the church. And so all across the board, that we're picking and mixing the Bible. The bits that we want to obey, we'll obey. And the bits that we don't want to, we don't obey. And God ain't going to bless the church like that. And it's rife, ripe throughout every denomination and every group of God's people. This attitude of picking and mixing with the Bible is rife. In the theological seminaries, it's absolutely rife. We have seminary professors who, will, who, who do this, pick and mix the bits that they like and they don't like, and excuse it away with sophisticated hermeneutics. God will never, ever bless seminaries, he'll never bless churches, he'll never bless pastorates, he'll never bless ministries that advocate these kind of attitudes or people. And God's people are suffering because of this kind of attitude. But also, there is sin in the camp. There are things going on in churches, sexual sins and immoral things that are going on in churches, and the churches are not saying anything about it. We, we have gay uh, marriage now in the Church of Scotland. It is coming in the Church of England. And the Orthodox ministers are, are not challenging it as much as they should do. They're not speaking out as much as they should do. And they're allowing it to become normalized. And God is not going to bless churches that compromise on sin. And in our own lives, in our own private lives, it's so easy to get ensnared with sin. With the internet and, and people are... Uh, a cocoon in their own even if you're married and you've got a family you can still have your own private cocoon life where nobody can see what you're doing and you can be seeing things and getting involved with things that you know are not wholesome and helpful and these things creep in the church creep in our lives and God will not bless you you said Jay you're a Pharisee you, you, you're just a Pharisee bro you're preaching holiness, holiness, and you're just judging, you're just condemning. It's a load of rubbish. You're just a hypocrite, bro. You, you are a Pharisee. Now, we all have issues. Everybody has issues, but, but God did not save us to have issues. He saved us to victory. He saved us to have victory. He did not save us to fail. He saved us to be victorious. We can live a victorious life if we run with the things of God. David messed up. Peter messed up. Moses messed up. God's servants mess up. We mess up. We all mess up. But that is not the norm. The norm of the Christian life is that God has called you to holiness and he wants you to be a clean vessel. That is the normal Christian life. And if we're sinning and if we're failing, the problem is that we just don't fully understand the blessings of being saved and the blessings of the resources that we now have in Christ. That we now have the Holy Spirit and that we can now walk in the way that God has called us to walk. So there is a, a higher life that we can live if we trust the Lord and go with him. But the church will never ever see the fire of revival, the fire of God moving until the church, until individually all of us confess and purge our lives of sin.
It says in that Hebrews passage, 12, 14, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If you want to see God move in America, if you want to see God move in Europe, then we've got to be clean vessels. We've got to get right with God and we've got to be real with him. In verse uh, 7, uh, go to Thessalonians chapter 1, verse chapter uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 7. For they that sleep in the, in the night, and they that are drunk, are drunk in the night. Verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the, the hope of salvation. You need to put on the spiritual armor of God. Which you can read in Ephesians 6. So I've come to the end of the sermon. I'll just recap. Sorry, I'm getting a bit tired, so I'll just... The Lord has his season, man has his season, the Lord has his season. This is the last days and the Lord's coming back. It's a teaching that we don't hear much of. I've asked, do you have a hope in the last days? Are you really, really saved? Or are you like those five million assemblies of God people who said they were saved, but most of them left the church and only 500,000 stayed? Are you a fake Christian or are you real? Are you grounded in the, in, in, in the last days? Watching TV, God channel and... Uh, it's not going to help you if you're not grounded in the Word of God. You need to be grounded, studying and saturating yourself in the Word of God so you begin to be able to discern error. Are you ready in these last days? True spirituality, true godliness means you meditate much on the Lord's second coming that He could come back in your generation. If that is a note that is missing in your church, in your ministry, in your life, then that is a warning bell that you become secularized without realizing it. Are you walking in the light? People can say whatever they want. They can have prayer meetings, they can fast, they can uh, do apologetics, they can do political activism. They can unite with other Christians, but it will never ever change the nation that you're in until the people of God repent of their sin and start to live a holy life. The church is called to holiness in these last days. And that's my uh, thinking, so my sermon for you today. I'm tired and uh, I preach this today. I hope that's been a blessing to you, so I I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this message for you. Father, I just thank you uh, for this message. And I just pray, Lord, that this message would, would speak to me and also speak to those who heard it, Lord. And I pray you'd apply it to all our hearts. That, Father, we would be the men and women that you've called us to be in these last days. Help us, Lord, to have a healthy fear, Lord. And also healthy joy and expectation that you could come back in our generation. So Father, help us in these days and guide us. And I pray, dear God, that you bless each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll have, uh, we've got a couple of other talks to do. One is on uh, a seminar on the canon. And then uh, there's a couple of videos I'm going to make soon on hell, one on hell, uh, a scholarly refutation of annihilism, annihilationism and, 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 and showing you what the Bible teaches about hell. 
and also a scholarly uh, seminar on the deity of Christ in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, combating uh, Islamic uh, apologetics uh, on that topic. So those are some seminars that will come out in the next few days. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this sermon and I hope it's been a blessing to you and God bless you and have a lovely day. God bless you.